This week on Hermitcraft, it is brought to you by Raid Minecraft Village. Raid Minecraft Village is an immersive online experience with everything you'd expect from a brand new RPG title. It's got an amazing storyline, awesome 3D graphics, giant boss fights, PvP battles, and hundreds of emeralds if you can get it to farm right. So go ahead and check out the video description. There you will find a link to the Minecraft Raid farm using which you can get 50,000 emeralds immediately and a free undying totem courtesy of whoever agrees to build it on your server. Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap, my name is Pixel Riffs, our writer is Loy XP, captions on this video were provided by Liara, and this week I saw the dramatic conclusion of the Diamond Ore Pillar Saga, or as we've been calling it, the most confusing Skyblock Let's Play. It makes sense for the Hermits to wrap up this rivalry and reclaim their Towers of Treasure with Minecraft 1.19 just around the corner, so they can buy all the mangrove they don't want to go find themselves, and presumably invest in whatever Tango Tech's going to do with the Warden. So before all that happens, let's take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Starting with Corallis, and do you see what we mean about the raid farms? Having dug up a multi-raid design and applied it on the server, he and Azuma are soon shocked to realize that they're farming more materials than they can sort or store. Drop down gorgeous. Oh. Which means Corallis has time to swing by the cookout camp and talk log with Ren Dog. With the lumber yard well and truly open for business and the ceremonial TNT smashed against the side, Ren puts the POW into gunpowder and time lapses his entire tree farm into existence. Although he's smart enough not to prime it until Corallis has been trained in its operation and helped grow a handful of the first trees they'll harvest. Get your notepad and pen out, Corallis, because this is gets complicated, all right? With that taken care of, the two of them stand back and watch the fireworks. But that's not the only side of the business that's growing. Since Gigapies haven't been flying off the shelves, Ren shelves that idea and pivots to manufacturing jack-o'-lanterns, which is either a handy utility shop for people who want cheap and effective lighting, or it's a long, long, long-term bid to corner the market for Halloween decorations. You could say Azumavoid decided to grow a spine. Literally, as he develops the descent under the ground below the mountain skull. Though I don't remember human bones being this hollow, I haven't checked mine too recently. You especially wouldn't expect a cylinder-shaped tumour on the side of yours, but Azuma digs one out as well. It's a slime farm, of course, that funnels the slimes into the nether, as if X's frames weren't bad enough around Tango's nether hub. Luke Marvel, you can see that my frames are just getting destroyed, especially when standing in this spot here. I, I need to find a way to optimize my Minecraft setup. So we're gonna throw some piston updates into the mix, why not? Azuma also builds a tree farm, so that's entity overload, block updates, and TNT duping all at once. A lot of things could go wrong, but still less than if Corallis was pushing the buttons. As the raid farms march victoriously over the server, Tango Tech, Grian, and Scar decide to finally test out their one. Surprisingly, Scar's spawn proofing doesn't fail them, but something sure fails Tango Tech off of the thing, and his giblets are quickly ground up into the system. The utmost confidence in you, Scar. I appreciate that. Tango, I didn't hear you, your confidence words. Um, brimming! Brimming! <laughs> what? What have you done? What have you done? <laughs> I have to fly! I'll be back! Hold on! Vex! No! No! I'm dead! I'm dead! Oh, that was bits of that, 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 that went well. <laughs> Once the machine is safely operational, we cut back to the nether hub, where Tango has been working hard to bring the main branch tunnels to the same level of detail as the main room. It helps that Joe and Cleo filled in some of it behind his back. The time they saved for him is channeled into stripping the trees from the future base site and prepping the place for building. Anyone else feel like they just watched a forest dissolve? Anyway, you might be wondering why Cubfan is dual wielding netherite hose. You might be wondering, why in the world am I dual-wielding netherite enchanted diamond hose? Well, as it turns out, serious dedication is very necessary when you open a store selling all sorts of greenery to Scar, and maybe some other people. Cub goes through some of the durability, collecting anything from leaves to drip leaves that a tree hugger could use, only taking a break to come help the Diamond Beard Bros quest for dominance. We should probably do something about it. But yeah, I don't really have a, I don't really have any good ideas. Impulse XV crafted and him meet up once again, find their diamond blocks scattered, and redirect the projectile blasting their pillar at someone else's one using advanced make-believe portal technology. Can so we add a little bit? We just use this as part of our tower. Is that what you're suggesting? I mean, why not use this to boost it's, us? It's a sturdy base. But that was the last hurrah for the diamond block front. In their absence, Grian and Good Times with Scar decide to join forces with Pearlescent Moon and connect their diamond ore towers. Luckily for them, Grian has some experience with floating rocks by now. I mean, look at his base. 
And since Pearl's pillar is descending down from the sky while theirs is rising from the ground, such a union would create a pillar reaching from the sky to the ground, which I guess was the wind condition all along. Admittedly, it would be hard to beat in any meaningful sense no matter what the competition was actually about. The real treasure was the treasure we treasured along the way. Thank Hot you. guy! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I concede. Oh, no! <laughs> Yo, Doc heard you like flying machines, so he put flying machines in his flying machines so he could remove parts of old flying machines. In fact, he deploys one to remove the final line of pumpkins from the World Eater setup, several dozen to completely farm an amethyst geode, one in an unsuccessful attempt to sabotage Green and Scar as they attempted to win the Diamond Ore Pillar contest once and for all, a totally new machine to lift all the scrappy blocks from the bottom of the perimeter, and one final flight of the World Eater to chew those up and leave him with a flat floor give or take a few missing blocks, and the persistent patches of lava, which are probably best left there to cook slime for now. Whenever you need to do something, build a flying machine for it. <laughs> Simple logic. In an unusual twist, we also see Joe Hills tackling the new territory of flying machines in an attempt to sweep all the water from the inside of his pinball machine base. I believe in me. No, I just thought it, it ran off with a piston. Come back! He has enough slime blocks from helping Doc clean up after the World Eater that he's got the equipment ready to go, even if the rest of his own equipment perished in an unfortunate lava bath. The next bath is a much more bearable temperature, although it turns out the kelp has been adding more water back in as it grows. But after a lot of kelp harvesting and a few refinements to the system, Joe manages to clear out as much space as he needs to avoid the pinball components getting wet. XB Crafted also fits a flying machine into his base, although this one's a little more permanent. And despite the name and the giant elevator scaffold now rising from the floor of his deep slate cave to the nearby village, his machine is much more down to earth. It's there to harvest a sugarcane farm he sets up under the floor of his storage area, both to cut down on trips back to his spawn base and to have something more entertaining than dirt path to walk on. I really, really like how this turned out. But while XB and Hypno are both busy with their own things, Horsehead Farms nevertheless rides again. Not actually, but the mirrored seahorse decoration zombie Cleo built as the beginning of her base certainly has the same spirit. Cleo's moving out into the ocean to build an Atlantis, a floating ring of concrete over the waves to be progressed into an ancient city, or sunk, the jury's still out. The large supply of concrete leaves behind some gravel ripe for redistribution. Shout out to gravel, worst thing to gather, this post was made by the Hate Gravel Gang. Thankfully, Cleo will be saving her server mates the trouble by just selling it, as long as the hermits are fine with setting foot into a dark shack in the middle of the woods owned by a literal zombie. Um, I'm also very aware that I would probably do well with, like, getting different colours of inks to sell, sell in a, you know, what's ultimately going to be a cement shop. I'm not going to do the, the, the sand because that's, that's ludicrous. The dangers of the forest are escalated when Hypno shows up with a giant panda, actively eating out of his honey shop, totally oblivious to False Symmetry's giant bee across the aisle. And it feels worth pointing out that while this display was inspired by Winnie the Pooh and adapting him as a Minecraft panda is pretty clever, the actual character has entered public domain so he could have just built the real thing. Just put the blue pants on him to differentiate from the Disney one or something. So that's what we got for sale for right now. Now you'll notice there's a whole lot of other barrels here. Mm-hmm. In fact, there's enough barrels here to sell one of each different type of candle. So that'll be future expansion. Amidst these giants, it's almost comical to see Scar build up his own shop in a fairly realistic, if really oversized, style. The extra space is, however, justified. This is a redstone shop on a server full of raid farms, after all. People will crave this stuff in bulk, and it helps to have the extra stories to display the components in. The Diamond Pillar contest wasn't the only thing cluttering up Spawn, and when he's not assembling the Diamond Block Beard Avengers to talk about the anvil in the room, Impulse SV spends some time lagbusting by moving his villagers out to his industrial area. The plan this time is to make the whole thing bigger and more self-sustaining, with overflow resources going to feed other farms. And he figures what better transport mechanism than shulker boxes. So while he's not the first hermit to bring a shulker back from the end, he is the first to construct a proper shulker farm with it. The design, by ending credits, produces more shulkers than he ever imagined, and some of them even managed to stay in the farm. The others, though... This should be fun. 
Vintage Beef might be a little late to participate in the Diamond Pillar competition, but for all we know he might still need his diamonds for a specific shade of light blue, because he's redesigned B00's player card with some more even shading, and with that looking more crisp, he adds a gold star and some different moves for the rare variant card. And I like how chunky the star is, it's kind of adorable. Not gonna lie, kind of adorable. Pearlescent Moon is, for now, much more interested in how clean B-Dubs' moss shop is, because her own shop is ready for its grand opening, so she suits up, parks a garbage truck outside, and moves in some bin chickens. And that is on my brand new garbage truck. Oh no, we've got two baby chickens. Oh no, that's a problem. I've only got one name tag. Her other moves are made in the Diamond Pillar contest, and though she didn't know it at the time of recording, might have turned out to be the winning plays. Noticing the, uh, structural instabilities in Doc M's bridge, she breaks it off and props up the rest with balloons, then goes mining in deep slate levels with the assistance of a wither, so she can add another stack of ore to the descending pillar. And while she ended up being the bridge to victory for some of her server mates, she also builds a bridge of her own, connecting Impulse's base from her own landscape across the river. We've done quite a lot, you know, we've done the bridge, we've made improvements. And finally there's Stress Monster, who keeps the shenanigans moving by dropping off the dare stick TM, 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 at spawn for Kiralis, then hops back to the dark forest to recruit some stonemasons. To help them feel more at home, she digs into a nearby hillside and starts a custom mineshaft, but soon enough she discovers that behind her cute little mine is an enormous and foreboding dripstone cave. Oh no! I could literally leave it open like this, put some glass in there, oh, and then I've... Mm, I don't know what to do now. But with that area cordoned off and actually providing a pretty cool backdrop, Stress can lay the plans for a mega shop trading everything she can get out of villagers. A super market. And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is Pixel Riffs. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.